last topic in the nervous system, and I'm going to go over it um, in not a ton of detail. It's just important that you have met this terminology and know a little bit about it before you get into physiology. I want to talk a little bit more about the autonomic nervous system. I want to remind you what we said about um, the functional organization of the nervous system. Um, this is the figure from um, chapter 14, I think. Yeah, chapter 14. And so what I'm really talking about is the autonomic motor division of the efferent or motor nervous system. And so we kind of drew this before. So let me remind you of the figure we kind of drew on the board. And then I want to tell you where we're focusing right now. So the focus for right now um, is uh, we're talking specifically about the efferent nervous system, okay? really pronounced efferent. And um, I want to talk about the autonomic branch of the efferent nervous system, which goes to cardiac muscles, smooth muscle and gland effectors. And then really what I want to do here that I didn't do before is give you guys a little more information about the two branches of the autonomic nervous system, which is the sympathetic and the parasympathetic branches of the autonomic nervous system. They both go to mostly the same effectors. So whereas skeletal muscle over here would have a single hookup to from the somatic motor division, and you would either stimulate skeletal muscle to try to get it to contract or you would leave it alone. Um, cardiac muscle, for instance, um, cardiac muscle actually has two nervous system hookups. It's got the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system is often referred to as the fight or flight division. You will use it when you're scared, when you're exercising, those kinds of things. Um, and the parasympathetic division is often referred to as the feed or breed division. And so basically, um, depending on whether you are for instance, um, threatened, there's a tiger chasing you. You have different needs for those effectors, cardiac muscle, smooth muscle, and glands. So I want to talk a little bit about how the anatomy of the autonomic nervous system works and a little tiny bit about the physiology just to get you started to thinking, thinking about it. So um, one of the things that's important about the nervous system is understanding the terminology and you know that you have to practice it quite a bit to get it. So this is the autonomic division. It's also sometimes called the visceral motor division. And so some general information to make sure that you know when you're using this terminology. Is the autonomic nervous system um, running through the CNS? Is it in the central nervous system or is it primarily in the peripheral nervous system? It is primarily um, PNS. Okay. And is it afferent, so let's do that again, is it afferent sensory or efferent motor, the autonomic nervous system? It is motor, okay, and um, it is mainly under control of some old, not conscious portions of the brain, um, the hypothalamus, which is in the diencephalon in the middle, and even older than that, two regions in the brainstem, the medulla oblongata and the pons. Because of that, um, you don't have conscious or voluntary control over autonomic effector organs, which again, remember, are cardiac muscles, smooth muscle, and glands primarily. So it's involuntary and it's automatic. Um, cerebral cortex in some situations can override what the autonomic nervous system is doing. Don't depend on it. So the ANS is not under direct conscious control at all. And of course, the effectors that it has, and let's make that bold so you remember, um, are cardiac muscle, smooth muscle, and glands. That's enough of a start. And then there are two branches, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic divisions of the autonomic nervous system. And really what it is, is they're going to be hooked up to primarily the same organs, but you're not going to use them most of the time at the same time. So when the sympathetic nervous system kicks in, what it will do is it will increase the activity of anything that might help 
you get away from the tiger, okay? If it wouldn't help you get away from the tiger, then expect the sympathetic nervous system to decrease its activity. Give you an example. Sympathetic nervous system, tiger walks in the room. The sympathetic nervous system kicks in, the fight or flight division. And what it should do, the cardiac muscle, is increase its activity because cardiac muscle, of course, will aid in blood flow and you might need that when there's a tiger around. But the sympathetic nervous system, um, what do you think it's going to do to the smooth muscle in your digestive tract? Should you increase the activity of the smooth muscle? Would it help with the tiger? Or would it potentially use valuable resources for something that wouldn't help you get away from a tiger? You don't need to digest your food. If the tiger is going to eat you, let him digest your breakfast burrito. So what the sympathetic nervous system would do to the smooth muscle of the intestine is inhibit its activity. It would increase the activity of the heart, but it would decrease the activity of anything that wouldn't be helpful with a tiger. Totally an oversimplification, but it's a good place to get started. Okay, so the sympathetic and the parasympathetic mostly innervate what we call the same effector organs. So don't freak out about this, it's not too bad. Okay, this is the sympathetic nervous system and this is all the effector organs that it goes to. But look, please, and notice that with this picture that is the parasympathetic nervous system, it goes to mostly the same organs. There are a couple of exceptions, we won't worry about those too much right now. So the sympathetic basically Let's go back here. The sympathetic does motor innervation, yes, of cardiac muscle, smooth muscle, and glands, and in fight or flight or exercise situations. So I'm not particularly nervous right now. I would imagine more parasympathetic activity than sympathetic activity. But if a tiger walks in, I'm definitely going to get nervous, and I will turn off or down the parasympathetic nervous system and turn up the sympathetic nervous system. The parasympathetic nervous system is motor innervation of the same organs, but under different circumstances. So, um, cardiac muscle, smooth muscle, and glands. Right now, feed or breed. I had a piece of toast, probably digesting it right now. It is going to require smooth muscle contraction in my digestive tract, and I can afford to do that right now. Um, so it's often called the feed or breed or rest and digest um, system. And so, um, Let's start looking a little bit at the anatomy, okay? This looks horrible, but it's really not that bad. The sympathetic um, and the parasympathetic nervous system, not surprisingly, both start in the CNS and go through the PNS. They're actually considered part of the PNS, but you know, you have to hook to the central nervous system sometime. So um, they originate in the central nervous system and they go to the effectors, cardiac muscle, smooth muscle, and glands but they have different anatomical roots to get there. So, sympathetic nervous system. You can tell it's sympathetic nervous system because it originates from T1 through about L2. Okay, that's where it's coming from. It, because of that, um, the sympathetic nervous system is sometimes referred to as the thoracolumbar division because it's coming from the thoracic region, the spinal cord and the lumbar region. Okay, so this is going mostly to the same organs with cardiac muscle, smooth muscle, and glands in them. But you can tell this is sympathetic because of where it's coming from. This one right here, come on, this one, the parasympathetic nervous system originates from four different cranial nerves attached to the brain, and then nothing until you get down to the sacral region of the spinal, spinal cord. So it's super easy to tell which one's sympathetic, originating from the thoracic lumbar region, and parasympathetic, cranial nerves, nothing until you get to the sacral region. They're gonna end up mostly at the same place, but um, they originate from different places. So um, this is really, really easy to understand. And it's right here too. So do you see how easy it is in your notes? Even if this wasn't labeled, let me cover up the labels. Can you tell in your notes which one's sympathetic and which one's parasympathetic? Yeah, you totally can, right? So originating from the thoracic and a little bit of the lumbar, that is the sympathetic nervous system. Originating from cranial nerves and nothing until you get to the sacral region, that's parasympathetic, cool? Okay, so let's go back to a little bit more anatomy. Um, by the way, a lot of times the parasympathetic division because of where it comes from, is called the craniosacral division. Okay, 
So other things that are true about the autonomic nervous system, and this ends up being important um, in fizz, is that on my way from um, the central nervous system to the effector, there are two neurons in series um, and a ganglion in between. So let me show you what that looks like right here. Okay, this is just general. So I'm going to have one neuron, the first one is brown here, okay? Then a ganglion, then another neuron, and then I get to the effector. So two neurons and a ganglion on the way from the CNS to the effector. That's different than skeletal muscle. Skeletal muscle has one neuron cell body in the central nervous system and its axon goes all the way to the effector. So terminology associated with here. This first neuron is before the ganglion, so we call it the preganglionic neuron, okay? Its cell body originates in the CNS, usually in the gray matter of the brain or the spinal cord, and its axon stretches to a ganglion. It's gonna form a synapse in the ganglion, and then um, the postganglionic axon is the one that extends after the ganglion, hence postganglionic, and that one is going to go to the effector. Now, um, for reasons that aren't worth describing right now, generally speaking, the preganglionic one is myelinated and the postganglionic one is not myelinated. Um, this actually makes the um, autonomic nervous system a little slower than the somatic division of the nervous system. Um, okay, and let me show you. Remember how these were represented? The preganglionic one was brown and the postganglionic one was blue. Um, let me show you that here too. So preganglionic one, postganglionic one going to the effector, preganglionic one, postganglionic one going to the effector. Um, so the, um, and then same thing here, preganglionic ones, postganglionic ones going to the effector. So um, the postganglionic neurons, so cardiac muscle, everybody can picture the heart. So um, instead of, like I said before, um, the somatic nervous system just has one um, hookup to skeletal muscle and either you stimulate it and try to get it to contract or you leave it alone. But the heart actually has two hookups. Think of it as gas and brakes. So the brakes on the heart, let's the parasympathetic nervous system, say you can chill, there's no tiger. And it's actively inhibiting what the heart can do. Think of it as putting your foot on the brakes. And then a tiger walks in and the first thing you do is take your foot off the brakes and that increases your heart rate a little bit, just like it would in your car, but not enough to get away from a tiger. So now I have to add the gas and that is the sympathetic nervous system. So it's called dual innervation. I have two hookups to the heart, whereas I only had one to skeletal muscle. So conceptually, how can you cause two different things to happen on the same organ? It's because they actually release two different neurotransmitters. The sympathetic nervous system releases a neurotransmitter called norepinephrine, sometimes also called noradrenaline, and the parasympathetic nervous system releases a different neuro neurotransmitter called acetylcholine. Okay, so, and that's some fizz that you will get into in detail later, but you can't basically release the same chemical at the same t tissue um, and cause two different effects. So that the, re the way that they cause two different things to happen, for instance, on the heart, is by releasing two different chemicals. Okay, um, last little tidbit about the basic anatomy is simply that um, with the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system, the pre- and post-ganglionic axons are different lengths, um, which means the ganglion is going to end up in a different place. So stick with me for just a second. If I have a short pre-ganglionic axon, then the ganglia are going to end up close to the spinal cord if it originated in the spinal cord. Um, so short pre-ganglionic axons will mean um, this the ganglia are right next to the spinal cord. And so that is what is true in the sympathetic nervous system. Short preganglionic axons, which means the ganglia are all close to the spinal cord, mostly close to the spinal cord. And there's one on each side of the spinal cord. These are called with the sympathetic nervous system because they're right next to the spinal cord and you're seeing them right here as well. These little blobs that you see right there. They're called um, sympathetic chain ganglia or sympathetic trunk ganglia. 
and they're lateral to the spinal cord on either side. We don't have them dissected out on the cadavers because we kind of have to trash the thoracic cavity in order to see them. So just trust me that they're there. The parasympathetic nervous system, though, is different. So please note short brown ones, long blue ones here. And the parasympathetic nervous system is different. Long brown ones, short blue ones. That means that the ganglia are closer to the effector or the organ that it's um, going to uh, um, innervate. So like with this one, the ganglion for the heart is actually all the way on the surface of the heart. So um, with parasympathetic nervous system, long preganglionic axons and short postganglionic axons. Okay, um, let's do a couple of examples of effects of parasympathetic and sympathetic innervation um, just to sort of get you thinking about it. Okay, so the way that I think about this stuff is to think about resource allocation. So if a tiger is in the room and I have a finite amount of oxygen and nutrients and blood, I really have to be careful where I spend my oxygens and oxygen and nutrients and send my blood. So um, with the sympathetic nervous system, really only increase activities of organs um, that could help you with a tiger. With the parasympathetic nervous system, generally do the opposite. So let's do sympathetic first and then we'll come back to parasympathetic. Okay, so if we're talking about the sympathetic nervous system again, um, see a tiger, go, oh crap, tiger, send a stimulation down to the thoracic region of the spinal cord, out through the ganglia, and then go to all of these places. But which ones does it increase and which ones does it decrease the activity of? What can help with the tiger is the way to think about it. So this isn't an ex uh, exhaustive list at all, but to get you started thinking about it, these are some examples of some sympathetic fight or flight effects on the target organs. Of course, this is all motor activity, right? Because we're sympathetic nervous system is motor. And they're all originating from the thoracic and lumbar regions. They're all going through these sympathetic ganglia on their way to the effectors. So what could help with the tigers? Should I increase or decrease my cardiac muscle activity? Sorry, you should increase, right? More blood flow, tigers. Should I send blood everywhere or be really, really specific about where I send blood and send it primarily to lungs, brain, heart, skeletal muscles? Yeah, I should vasoconstrict most places and send them less blood and then send more blood just a few places. So it causes more vasoconstriction than vasodilation. A few places you vasodilate. How about your bronchioles? Smooth muscle controlling your bronchioles. Should you let more air in or less air in? Causes dilation of the bronchioles to get more air in. Should you increase or decrease the activity of your digestive organs? Is that gonna help you with the tiger? You should decrease the activity of your digestive organs. It costs you something. There's no reason to use it at that particular moment. Now, it does stimulate your sweat glands, but only because all of this other activity tends to heat you up. And then one other thing that it does is this little guy right here. It actually stimulates your adrenal glands, specifically the adrenal medulla, to dump um, adrenaline into the bloodstream. The other word for adrenaline is epinephrine. And what that does is keeps you wound up all of your parts going that could help going really quickly until you get away from the tiger. So that is the sympathetic. Now let's look at the parasympathetic. And the parasympathetic reinforces some stuff that you did with cranial nerves. So with the parasympathetic, remember we are going to think about this, control cardiac muscle, smooth muscle and glands from four cranial nerves that you learned before and then nothing until I get to the sacral region of the spinal cord, okay? So um, what I'm going to do here is, this is feed or breed or rest and digest activity. These are things I can afford to do when there is no tiger around. And I am specifically going to be causing things to happen in cardiac muscle, smooth muscle and glands. So what can you afford to do when a tiger isn't around and you should not be doing when a tiger is around that involves cardiac muscle, smooth muscle and glands. So this is not controlling skeletal muscle. So parasympathetic effects through the cranial nerve. First is cranial nerve number three, which is the oculomotor nerve. It goes to 
related to autonomic nervous system, some smooth muscle and that is responsible for, for instance, um, pupil constriction and focusing. So what that is going to do is um, the sympathetic nervous system generally causes pupil dilation. So you can see every hair on the tiger. And this one const uh, constricts pupils back down. And it helps with focusing as well. Um, the facial nerve, which is cranial nerve number seven. What does it do related to this? Um, glandular secretion in the head. Tears, not because I'm crying, but to wet my eyes. Um, nasal secretions and salivary gland secretion. You can do, you can afford to do all of that when there's no tiger around. And then the glossopharyngeal nerve, which is cranial nerve number nine, does more salivary gland secretion because it innervates the parotid um, salivary gland. And then the one that does most of the action here is um, cranial nerve number 10 which is the vagus nerve, and it's called the vagus nerve because it's a vagrant and it wanders down into the ventral body cavity instead of just doing head stuff. And the vagus nerve controls feed or breed, rest and digest activity of cardiac muscle, smooth muscle, and glands pretty much until you get down to um, the um, pelvic cavity and the external genitalia. So. It's going to control normal feeder breed functionality. It's going to um, do like decrease the heart rate because we don't need it faster, right? But it's going to like increase um, muscular contraction in the digestive tract and glandular secretion in the digestive tract. It does all of that stuff. It even does the testes and the ovaries because the testes used to be up in the um, abdominal cavity. They moved to down during um, development. Okay, so this is like controlling normal functionality of um, the vast majority of the ventral body cavity. Um, feed and breed functionality is controlled um, through cranial nerve number 10. But then all the way down here from S2 through S4, so the parasympathetic effects that go through the sacral region of the spinal cord, um, this is innervating normal feed or breed functionality of um, the pelvic cavity primarily and like you've got the distal um, portion of the large intestine, the rectum, the bladder and then the external genitalia, the uterus, um, the vagina. Um, so what this does is it controls the functionality of like stimulation of defecation because the distal end right here stimulation of urination and erectile functionality. So think about someone who had a spinal cord injury and their parasympathetic functionality. Even a really low spinal cord injury, I don't know, L2, um, could potentially and would potentially impact this functionality because I can't get the command to go all the way down to um, the distal region of the spinal cord. So um, that is <clears throat> the relationship. Um, a lot of times all of this functionality is happening totally normal, but you can, for instance, need to come up with a different way to initiate or control um, urination, defecation, erection, and sometimes, you know, catheters and things like that are possible. And it depends on how much damage was done down there. Okay, so that's the end of the nervous system for anatomy.